Tell me exactly in your own words, and I want you to be honest with me, what you did that got you in prison. I was still being young and I messed with a, a female younger than me. And I, I slept with her and everything. And I guess it was the child in me and I was still, being, by me being young, I was still acting young. I was still trying to be a, a 17 year old little boy. And I, I'm, I, I was a grown man at the time. How old were you? I was 20 years old. And how old was she? I think she I think she was like 16, 17, I don't know. Uh, How about 15? Sir? How about 50? You, you still don't know how old she is and you're in prison? I, I, I still don't know how old she was. She was 15. Okay, I, yeah. Well, we're about to watch the parole hearing of a man who was initially, but blew that and then was sentenced to just four years for this crime. We'll listen to it and unpack it at the end. DOC 728533, you're classified as a second felony offender. You were sentenced December of 2017 for simple burglary. You received a three-year sentence. You were afforded probation. However, that was revoked in September of 2019. When you got new felony conviction, that being carnal knowledge, uh, you received a four-year sentence and obscenity, a three-year sentence. Those are running concurrently. So your total DOC sentence is four years. Your parole eligibility is June 23rd, 2022. You do not earn good time. So your full term date is June 24th, 2023. Does all that sound correct? Yes, ma'am. All right, Mr. Mirabella. Mr. Johnson, good morning. My name is Tony Marabella. Your case was assigned to me, so I'll be I'll start our interview process. Uh, how old are you, sir? 23. 23? And yes, how long in prison these charges? I've been in prison 34 months. 34 months? Yes, sir. Did you serve any time on the burglary charge or was it just straight probation? I I sat in jail three months and then I made uh, probation. And you were on probation at the time you got caught these charges? Yes, sir. <clears throat> Tell me exactly in your own words, and I want you to be honest with me, what you did that got you in prison. I was still being young and I messed with a, a female younger than me. And I, I slept with her and everything. And I guess it was the child in me and I was still being, by me being young, I was still acting young. I was still trying to be a, a 17 year old little boy. And I, I'm, I, I was a grown man at the time. How old were you? I was 20 years old. And how old was she? I think she, I think she was like 16, 17. I don't know. Uh, how about 15? Sir? How about 50? You, you still don't know how old she is and you're in I, prison? I, I still don't know how old she was. She was 15. Okay, I, yeah, I didn't know that. Tell me exactly what you and she did and what your charges were. You were originally charged with child pornography. Well, yeah, we, I slept with her and we made videos with each other. And I know that I, I was wrong for that. I was wrong. And you've taken, uh, it looks like one, uh, perhaps two classes or phases of uh, sex offender treatment there at Bozier. Is that right? Yes, sir. What, 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 well, how many, how many phases are there for the sex offender treatment? Aren't there four? Yes, sir. It's four phases. So you've done two so far? No, I've done all four. You've done all four of them? Yes, sir. You complete the, the third and fourth one? Yes, sir. When did you complete them? Um, I completed them in um, February. This year? Yes, sir. Right. Tell me what you learned in those programs that might help you not to do this again. 
I learned the 27 risk factors and justify blame denial. You know, it's just, I learned all of the risk factors. Okay, let, let, me, let, me, stop, let me stop you. Uh, I, I guess my question was very poorly asked. Tell me what you learned that applies specifically to you that will help you not do this in the future. So if there's some of the 27 risk factors that apply to you, tell me about it. Okay, I learned that I was justifying my actions, saying, you know, that I was justifying my actions, saying that I'm not that old and everything, but in all actuality, I, I was that I was too old to be messing with her. And I understand everything. Like when I first came to jail, I was in denial. I was trying to blame her for everything, but in all actuality, it was myself. So I had to do some self reservations and look at myself. I know that I did wrong, and I have a sister her age, and I just should have been more. Consider it. I did what wrong. Think, what do you think she goes through or what she's going through right now as a result of what happened? I know it probably messed up mentally. And I know she's going through a lot and I know her family's going through a lot. And I'm truly sorry for everything that I put them through. Why is that bad? Why is what you did bad? Why is there something wrong with what you did? Because of the age difference. Because of the age differences, I mean, it's like I took advantage of her because she's younger than me. And my mind is fully grown and her mind is not grown yet. I did wrong. Now I also see that you've done Steve Hoyle. Have you done that? Yes, sir, I did Steve Hoyle. How many phases did you do in that? I did all, um, I did two or three phases. What did you learn in that program? Um, well, I did empathy awareness. I did living in balance, anger management and mass. I learned that, you know, I learned, I learned a lot from all those different classes that could help me in that world when I get into the world, into society. Right. Do you have, have you ever used drugs or alcohol? I smoke marijuana. How often were you smoking marijuana? Constantly. Every day? Almost every day. And what is your plan to stay sober when you get out? Well, my plan to stay sober is to work hard, get a job with my mother, and, you know, say handle business. Like, I mean, I lost a lot of time. I have four kids, and I lost a lot of eight, a lot of time with them. My son is five years old. I left when he was two, you know, and you have four I, just don't want to, I just don't want to end up like everybody else. All the guys yeah. that's in prison, I don't want to end up Stop. like you, you have four children? Yes, sir. How many mothers to those children? Two. And uh, were you living with those mothers while this was going on? My, my, the mother of three of my children was living with me and my mother when it happened. When all this was going on? Yes, sir. You see anything wrong with that? Yes, sir, I do. Tell me about that. I had a woman that was there for me and I decided to cheat on her, constantly cheat on her. And, you know, that, that might've ruined the relationship between me and her, you know, and it might not, I might never be able to fix it. Are y'all still together? You expect to be together with her when you get out? Yes, sir. But it's hard because she done moved away and she wants me to come home and be with her and my kids, but I know one thing that I can't be around them. I have to get myself together. I have to focus on staying out of jail, staying out of trouble, period. I have to get a good job and so I could provide for her and my kids.
how are you going to stay sober? You tell me you're going to get a job, and uh, but, but what's your plan to stay sober? Well, classified by us as a very high risk to recidivate. That's a problem for me. So tell me how you intend to stay sober when you get out. I will probably attend a drug class. And what does the drug class look it, like to you? What what are you describing a drug class to be? Like AA and have you ever gone to an AA meeting? No, sir, I haven't. Do you know anything about AA? Not only the only what my teacher in here was telling me about it. Okay. Now you say thank you to Steve Hall program. Steve Hall is really dedicated for drugs and alcohol. You didn't take any substance abuse in Steve Hall? I I took Steve, I mean I took the uh, substance abuse class, but I don't know for firsthand for being in a class what it looks like or what they I know they talk about your drug problems. I know they talk about your alcohol problems. I know what it they like me and my teacher used to talk about the drugs and everything and how it it impairs your mind and consistent use what of you do you gotta if you get out tomorrow what's the first thing you're gonna do if you get out tomorrow what you gonna do register okay try to give me a job a good job in the plants with my mother okay and and just work and, and stay out of trouble. I mean, the drugs this is the farthest thing away from my mind right now. Like, I lost a lot of time in my life. Four, three years is a lot. So you think you're okay now not to go back to smoking marijuana or doing any other kind of drugs? Yes, sir. Where are you going to live with your mother? Well, until I get out, yeah, I'm going to live with my mother until I get on my feet. And when I get on my feet, I'm going to give me my own uh, house or something just to, you know, be by myself and focus on getting everything right. What kind of skills do you have? What kind of jobs have you ever had on the outside? Well, uh, my first job was I worked at Little Seasons. My second job was... You worked at Sorry, I, I worked at Little Seasons. My second job was um, McDonald's. My third job was working a cashier at Circle K. How long did you work each of those jobs? Well, I worked at Little Seasons for two years. I worked at Circle K for a year. I worked at McDonald's for like six months. Why'd you leave Little Caesars? Because, um, well, I just got tired of working though. And where did, did you go straight then to the other job? Yes, sir. I kept a job. I never went without a job once I got old enough. I enjoy working. Uh, Deputy Perman, what can you tell us about uh, Mr. Johnson? I don't have daily dealings with him as a general rule for me. If I'm not familiar with them and their name, that is definitely a good thing. And I'm not familiar with him and his name. Um, no type of, you know, write-ups getting in trouble or anything like that that's, you know, will bring him to attention. So, I mean, other than that, and I think y'all have some information from uh, Jason Johnson with the DOC classes and stuff. I think he uh, missed the time frame and everything to get logged in, but, uh, he wanted me to be sure to let you know that and everything. But now, if I don't know who they are, that's definitely a good thing. Thank you very much, ma'am. Uh-huh. I, I, I saw a couple of places. What other, Mr. Johnson, what other classes have you taken uh, besides I have, I have that you have taken um, a victim accountability letter training, uh, the Bozier uh, substance abuse uh, uh, sex offender class. I only had one and two. Uh, well, I, but you I, say you've done all four, and I've got you at uh, Steve Hall, phase one. What other classes have you taken? I took 
the sex offender treatment program. I got my certificate for the sex offender treatment program for phase, and I took anger management. I took living in balance. I took mass. I took empathy awareness. Yeah, I've got most of those. I didn't have the the, the, the last two uh, sex offender treatments. So thank you. That's all the questions. All right, uh, Mr. Johnson, is there something you'd like to say to us before we vote? Um, I just want to say that I know that everything that I did was wrong. And it's been eating me up inside because I know that I scored her. I know that I scored her family. And right now, I don't know what's running through their heads, but I do know that I'm very sorry for this and I won't never do this again. I took a lot of time on my life, a lot of time for my kids, a lot of time for my mother, my father. And I have a, a strong support system that will help me when I do re-enter society. I just, All right. I just want a new start. All right. We're going to hear from your family now. Let's hear from your mother, Miss Maya. Ma'am, we'd like to hear from you. Can you hear me? Yes, Ma'am. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, Go I'm John. Am I on the camera? Can y'all no, see me? We can, we, but we can hear you fine. Go ahead. Oh, but y'all can't see me. No, ma'am. No, ma'am. I don't know what happened to the. Okay. Start my beat. There I go. Hello? Ma'am. Okay. How y'all doing this morning? Good. Thank you. Yeah. I'm Jordan's mom. My name's Latonya Mayo. Uh, I'm here, a uh, supervisor at Fraternal Industries. I work at the refinery. Uh, my my concern is to get him a job upon with us here. Uh, I already talked with my supervision, and they don't. They're actually they don't mind. Uh, he's gonna live with me. Uh, I'm gonna support him. I'm gonna back him. You know, he was young when this happened, and I supported him then, and I support him now. Uh, I don't really think he knew the circumstances of what was going on. And from what we were told that the young lady falsified her age and he was, she was, you know, multiple guys, but by Jordan being who he is, he should have asked a question. He should have asked her age and then acted, but they were kids at the time he was young. And I feel like he's, you know, he had a, uh, he jumped into a whole nother world that he didn't even know what he was getting into. Now he knows what he's get he got into, and I'm uh, and we you know we talked about it and stuff like that, and he understand now. You know, um, he has to be aware of his surroundings, the drug part. Uh, we're gonna do everything that we possibly can. Like he said, that's the further thing for Miss Mind right now, and right out here we do regular drug screenings and all that. So. That won't be, that will not be. But uh, I'm hoping to welcome him home and I'm gonna do whatever I can to support him and, and give him a good start. Yes, ma'am, thank you. We, uh, we'd like to hear from David Johnson. Go ahead, sir. Good, good morning, how you doing? Um, I would like to say on my brother's behalf that I know that he's been through a lot and this is his first time going through the experience of being incarcerated. So I know the experience that he's went through then changed him and now he knows the situation, he knows the consequences of his actions. So hopefully he makes better decisions when he gets home. I know he has four kids out here, which are my nieces and nephews that miss him. And I know that when he was home, he was working. He was a manager. Like, he know how to run businesses. He knows what to do. He just made a mistake as a kid that we all made mistakes. And I just don't want this mistake to dictate him in the future to make better decisions. So 
I just wish my brother well, and I ask that y'all bless him with the chance to reunite with his family and get a chance to raise his kids the proper way. Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. And uh, Sister Latoya Mayo. Mayo. Hello, how y'all doing this morning? My name is Latoya Mayo. I'm Jordan's older sister, and um, I practically raised him, and um. He's a good a good guy. He was a good kid growing up. Um, I know he made a mistake in what he did, but I just hoping and wishing. I know he got kids that he need to get home to and take care of. Um, I just wanted to hoping that he could be able to have that blessing to come home and raise his kids and have family time uh, again like we used to. Like I said, I know he was young when he did what he did. He, he should have did. He should have asked, like my mother said. And at the end of the day, like I told him before, he, it should have never been it because he had someone at home and he wouldn't have to be in this predicament. But I know how it, it is or whatever to be away from your family. And I just wanted to the the blessings to have him come home and hopefully y'all can give him the blessings to come home and be with his family and his kids once again. I know kids make mistakes as a young adult, but it's always that maybe can we get that second chance? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you. We appreciate you uh, taking the time to give us your remarks. All right, I think we're prepared to vote, Mr. Mayor Bell. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, Mr. Johnson, uh, you've taken some good programs. Uh, uh, Steve Hoyle is, is a great program, but I'm, I'm a little concerned that you don't really have a plan to stay sober. I think your mother said, I think kind of what you said, and, and I think the comment was, drugs are the furthest thing from my mind right now. And, and I really need that to be the forefront of your mind, to stay off of drugs. I'm not sure whether it was your judgment back when you were 19 and 20 years old that led you to the crimes, or whether it was the drugs in addition to your judgment that led to those things. But clearly, the drugs are a big part of that. Uh, I would have hoped that having done some of Steve Hoyle, you would have gotten to learn more about AA in the 12 steps. And I think that's critical for you to have a plan or a blueprint to be able to stay sober. I had hoped you were going to tell me as soon as you got out, you were going to find an AA meeting. You told me you were going to get a job, you were going to do this, you were going to do that. I heard nothing about substance abuse. And that's my concern. So I'm hoping that between now and the time you get out, you're getting out next June, regardless of what happens today. Uh, uh, I'm hoping that uh, you can take some classes that will teach you the 12 steps and you can live your life with the 12 steps so you can have a plan to stay sober. My vote today is to deny you, but to encourage you to take programs that will help you stay sober when you get out. Thank you. Um, sir? Um, right, that's, I, that is finished, that's sir. Mr. Freeman? Um, Mr. Johnson, I, I'm going to vote to grant, and the reason I'm going to vote to grant is because I think you need supervision. If we wait till next year, you're going to have no supervision, no one to make you go to those sex offender classes, no one to make you go to the three AA meetings that make as a requirement. So that and also occur. All right. Uh Mr. Johnson, um, you've got one vote to deny and one vote to grant. Because of the nature of your charge, I think that the end result is going to be to deny. Um, but I, I would agree that, that I think you need supervision between now and then. You get you 
you good time out in June in a couple of months. Um, the full term is next year. Um, but because you've received one vote to de de deny two votes to grant, the end result today is that your, your parole's been denied. You need to develop a plan for a solid plan for your sobriety, sir. Wish you well. Today your parole's been denied. Good luck to you. Deputy Chairman, that concludes our business at Webster. We'll adjourn at 10 24. Thank you. I don't know what information is wrong, which information is accurate, but the information that Richard found me from this article, where they cracked down on 12 Louisiana, look at them right here, all these, to think, huh? To think. And they cracked down on them in 2019. And they go through the list of what each of them were arrested for. And Jordan, he was arrested on four counts of production and four counts of distribution under the age of 13. It was the result of an investigation by the LBI, Federal Bureau of Investigation, Louisiana, Probation, Parole, and Sulphur Police Department. Because remember, he was... He was on probation when he did this so it, it it really wouldn't surprise me at all if she was under that age because the parole board sometimes doesn't seem to get the records right now it could also be that this news agency made a mistake and no one caught it i don't know or it could be that they decided to drop certain charges and only charge him for others. I mean, that's pretty normal for Louisiana. You know, they invest all this time in, in, in doing uh, research and, and trying to see and trying to catch them. And he probably my guess is, again, I'm just guessing. I don't have any proof of this. It's speculation. But if he was trading it, maybe he was part of some group and he actually was trading it. And was somehow caught up in this group that was caught. It does, you know, you don't just have a sting operation happen where they go and arrest twelve people if there's no connection. You would, you would assume, right? But no, he played it off to be like, eh, he was twenty. She was, I don't know how old she was. How old do you think she was? Oh, 17. 17 is legal in, in consent in Louisiana. Maybe sixteen. How about fifteen? Well, how about under twelve? Or under 13. It's like, you know, you almost say, is it so, you know, is it, is he, which category does he fit under? Of, of right? But is it, you know, there are certain, there are certain predators that just obsess over young people. They, I say young people for YouTube, right? They're just obsessed. It's their life obsession. And there are others that, you know, the age is kind of close. Um, he didn't know or he kind of knew, but didn't think it was a big deal. And then there's others that are just like impulsive and they don't really think about it. But if the opportunity comes up, but I don't know what category to put him in because from the records that we have, she was under the age of 13. And, you know, it's funny. He uses the excuse of growing up and all of a sudden, how many kids does he have? And it's like, you're not a... There's so much frustration. And then really, you know, you can never blame a mother for supporting their child. But there's another thing to... to it seems like to be an enabler. What sounded to me like she was blaming the girl... Uh, she had a lot of uh, boyfriends. Uh, no one knew how old she was. And it's like, no, that's not the approach the parole board wants to hear. The parole board wants to hear you, uh, you know, <laughs> you, 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 they want to see that the mother is scarier than his parole, op, uh, parole officer is going to be. It's scarier than the law enforcement. That's what they're looking for. But. I'll include the link that that Richard provided. And but as far as we know, I mean, I don't know which one, but either way, uh, let's put the bottom line is, is that Louisiana 
gave him a four-year sentence. There was a four-year sentence and a three-year sentence, but for them to run concurrent, so just four years, uh, he's quite lucky. He didn't have possession with intent to distribute. He'd be spending a lot more time with that. Uh, uh, last night when I was looking at your material, you got the three big ones, sex crimes, violence, and drugs. Uh, and and you're young. How old are you? Twenty three. Twenty three. So um, so you um, I'm just gonna call out some information for the record because uh, they sent some information over. You've been enrolled in the nine month program, and your graduation is December the seventeenth of twenty twenty one. Is that still correct? No, ma'am. When is it now? Well, I'm in a six month program, and it's uh January fourteenth. Next okay. Okay. You know what? I do see that. It is not in the memo, but I do. I did write that. January the 14th. And you also in the sex offender program. You just completed phase. You're in phase one of the sex offender program, right? Yes, ma'am. You just started that in July? Yes, ma'am. So when do you think you'll be finished with the sex offender program? You don't know? No, ma'am. Oh, okay. Okay. Uh, do you think you ought to keep it? You ought to complete it? Good, ma'am. Good, good. Uh, so, and you also, you're being screened for the high set, right? You're in that process. Yes, ma'am. And uh, they, uh, the report says that you're going to start taking anger management next month. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Uh, when I look at your record, uh, explain to me in 2016, you had an aggravated battery charge. What happened there? What was going on? I was just around around the scene at the time. Well, how do you get charged? I don't know. I was just oh. I was just with my brothers now. Okay. And uh, and uh, in uh, in '97, you had attempted second degree murder. What about that? Same around the wrong crowd. Okay. All right. Are your brothers in jail now? Yes, ma'am. Uh, your current sex offense involved a young lady who was like 16 years of age. Is, is that correct? Mom. And uh, you, in, <clears throat> you indicated in the record in, in your application for a rehearing that uh, you had a son that was born February the 15th of 2021. Uh, yeah, Mom. Congratulations on that. That's your first child? Yes, Mom. Okay. Uh, that's supposed to change you. Parenthood is supposed to change it. Now, the one of the things that I'm curious about is the fact that you were in June of 2020, this girl must have been pregnant and you were over there choking somebody, another girl. How old, how old was your baby mother? How old is she? 22. Okay, she's 22. So were you still running around on her? No, ma. Well, when you do the math, she was pregnant when you were at your girlfriend's house choking her. If the Mom. baby was born in February, she was, you know, she was pregnant around that time, June of 2020. Mom. You, you have no comments on that? No, ma'am. Uh, um, so are you and the baby mother still together? Uh, no, ma'am. Okay, okay. Uh, let me make you aware of the fact that now that you are a sex offender, one of the things you said is that you want, you don't want to be a dad be dead. But because you are a sex offender, the law limits what kind of contact you can have even with your own children. Uh -huh. and, and, uh, when you, and the day is going to come when you get out. You need to make sure you are clear with your parole officer as to what the rules are in terms of having contact even with your own child. Uh -huh. uh, that's just, you know, that's just what you've done now. I do want to inform you as a part of this process, we reach out to the law enforcement community to get their opinion about early release. And all law enforcement is opposed to your early release. Yes, ma'am. Is, is this the longest time you spend in jail? Yes, ma'am. Okay. All right. So if you are successful today, tell me what your plans are. Change my life. Okay. Uh, where would you live and how would you support yourself? 
uh, get a job. My brother, my brother say, uh, when I come home, you already have a job for me. Where? In Vidalia, Louisiana. Okay, but but uh, doing what? Construction. Okay. Do you think you need a trade? That's mine. Uh, what trade would you take if you had the opportunity? Mechanic work. Okay. Tell me about your drug use history. When did it start? When I was like 13, 14. Uh, and uh, who introduced you to drugs? My cousins. Cousins, okay. And what did you start using at 13? Marijuana. And then what? That's it. What about alcohol? No, ma. Do you uh, do you recall where did you pick up on on the fact that it's okay to choke a girl? Where did you get that from? No one. The other battle in offense is you said you were in the crowd, but this but this domestic violence that was totally you. Mom. Uh, if you had a chance to speak to your to your victim, your last victim, what would you say to her? I apologize. What would you say? I, re I regret doing it. You know, I wish I could take it back, but I can't. Right. That's right. Right. Okay. What do you learn from that? What do you learn from this situation? I what have you learned from this situation? I'm not going through my head right now. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. That's all I had. Thanks for answering my questions. That's Mr. all I had. Mr. Shepard, how are you? Good morning. All right. Um, then I see somewhere that you're uh you said you completed domestic violence um programming. Uh, when I was in, I was almost finished, but they had shipped me, Concordia shipped me. Where, where were you enrolled in the domestic violence program? Concordia Parish. What parish? Concordia Parish. Concordia Parish. Um, how long had you been in that program? For four, four months. Okay. How often did you meet? Every week. So it was a 26 week program? Six month program. Six month program. And you they shipped you to, you're in Bossier? Claiborne. Claiborne. Uh, they shipped you there before you finished the domestic violence program. Is that correct? Yes, ma'am. So how, how are you going to be able to complete that? I don't know. And you're supposed to complete um, uh, the program that you're in now in January of next year. Is that correct? Yes, ma'am. So you, you told Ms. Wise that your plan was to do better, but that's just talk. Unless you have something specific, specific te uh, steps that you're going to take, then that's just talk and talk is cheap. So give me some specifics. I don't wanna hear how I'm just gonna do better. How are you gonna do better? What are you gonna to do to do better? Get a job, stay to myself. And you know, would you, why would you say, what do you mean stay to yourself? You live in a world, you, your family was involved in criminal activity. How are you gonna to stay to yourself? Do you think that's a realistic expectation that you're not going to be around your friends and your family. Let's be honest. No, ma'am. Well, then, how you going? Well, why would you say you're going to stay to yourself? I don't really hang out like that no more. I don't know what that means. And okay, what else are you going to do? No. And see, you, you don't have a plan. You don't have it together. Ma. 
I said, you, 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 you don't have specifics. You don't have, you know, step one, two, three, four. You're just talking in generalities and without a real structured plan that you're going to follow, then you're not going to do better. Yes, ma'am. And what about your GED? Um, I want it. I want to get my GED. I really want to. Can't you do that in the institution? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Do you think that would be a good idea to get it in the institution? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Uh, you dropped out in the ninth grade, is that correct? Yes, ma'am. Why? Um, I don't know. Bad decisions. Yeah, I, mean, I agree. You, know, you, you made a lot of bad ones. Yes, but my 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 you know thought is how are we going to get you to make good decisions? And just saying you got to do better is not you know going to get you there. You need a GED. You need a vocational skill, a specific job skill that you know how to do so you can get it a decent job. Uh, wow. You need to deal with your substance abuse issues, which involves, I didn't hear you say you were going to you know, try to get in AA or NA meetings. You just, you have nothing planned. And so without that, uh, Mr. Shepard, I'm afraid you're not going to do very well. you got to have some, some things, you know, set in stone. Um, but I appreciate you talking to me, and uh, that's all I have. Thank you, Ms. Jackson. Uh, do we have any visitors? There are no visitors. Okay. So would you like to make a statement to the board before we vote? Yes, sir. Did you say no? I, I saw you shake your head, but I didn't hear you. No, sir. Thank you very much. Is the board ready to vote? Yes. Ms. Wise? Thank you, sir. I, uh, I admitted asking the staff. Staff, is there any more input you have besides the report that you sent? No, ma'am. It's still the same. All right. Thank you. <clears throat> Uh, yeah, yeah, uh, Mr. Shepard, I, 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 I believe that you are getting what you need right where you're at. Uh, the, <clears throat> the staff indicated you're not a behavior problem, so you are really working on you. And I want you to continue to do that. My vote today is to deny because I want you to spend time taking advantage of every program there. Uh, I, because of it, you have not completed sex offender treatment, uh, lack of completion of programs. Uh, you have law enforcement opposition and, and the nature of your offenses uh, is very concerning to me. Uh, it shows in the record that you are transitional work eligible. So I don't know if they would move you because of your offense, but that's something you can ask for when you get through with this program or ask to get moved somewhere where you can learn a trade. Really take your time. I know you want to get out, but for me, it's about you getting the skills you need to stay out. So good luck to you, though, but my vote is to deny. Thank you, Ms. Wise. Ms. Jackson? Likewise, Mr. Shepard, you're on the right track. You're taking some positive uh, actions. I think you can benefit from completing all the programs that you're currently enrolled in, and in addition, getting your GED while you're incarcerated. Because I can tell you, once you get out, there are going to be so many things that are going to be competing with your attention. You're going to be more interested in getting a job than you are in getting your, your GED. So I think the best place for you to get it is exactly where you are right now. Uh, you have sufficient time uh, that you can work on those things. And so I'm going to vote to deny you today, but I'm going to encourage you to keep working. Keep working hard and you'll get there. Uh, you know, if you've accomplished all of those things by the time you apply again. Good luck to you. Thank you, Ms. Jackson. Uh, Mr. Shepard, uh, you have two votes to deny. I agree with my colleagues. My vote likewise is to deny for the reasons outlined by Ms. Wise. Uh, but I would encourage you as well to continue to do the things that you're doing. You're on the right track. Get that GED, get your education and get out there and get a job once you're done. So good luck to you, sir. But today your vote, your parole has been denied. 
Right. I'm kind of like dazed and confused from that one. Really? What did we just what did we just watch? You got the three big ones. Sex offense, violence, and drugs. Not only that, but you know, from what Richard shared, <laughs> he's he was charged initially with a lot worse. He was charged with second degree battery and five counts of attempted second degree murder. Um, obviously they didn't feel that that's what he's charged with and, and they didn't feel that, uh, he should have, you know, he was actually involved or they had a case on him or whatever it was, but how do you get such a light sentence? <laughs> a juvenile charge. He also has on top of that, there's another charge that he has. He has, um, sexual battery which i don't know then he has that dv i think what miss wise was saying is that he was choking her while she's pregnant and his interview it was just awful i i don't know i mean you can just feel his lack of anything the idea that a ged or any amount of programs is going to help it's uh you just have to be really naive. I don't know why a judge would look at someone's record like this and say, I think that this is a proper sentence. Seven years. Now, I mean, we have, you do see, judges don't want to just lock people up. They think, well, maybe, you know, you never had a real time at the DOC. So we don't want to throw away the key. Let's give you a sentence. And maybe you'll grow up a little bit. But in this case, it's clearly not happening. And I also wonder, because you could give a 15-year sentence, parole eligibility after serving whatever percentage of it is, is 25, 30%, and then at least that's hanging over their head um, on a revocation. Here, what you're going to have is just not that much time hanging over his head. And you can get out after... It's, you know, I just don't see how it's serving it's uh the point here um in terms of well it's not <laughs> that's clearly it's not it's scary he's still locked up so you know he's probably gonna end up serving his full seven years at least with the attitude that we saw here today i also don't know why they don't sometimes they ask to take the mask off sometimes they don't and um certainly i wish that they that it was a requirement this of course this hearing took place in 2021 so but he's still locked up two years later and we'll keep you posted on him if he does have another hearing we'll show it maybe he's maybe he just had a bad day maybe he will have a better hearing next time well um my oldest daughter i was touching her and um, kissing her in an inappropriate way You've taken a number of programs while you've been in there. Uh, what sort of things have you learned uh, in terms of uh, how this has affected the victim in this case? Well, by having her own party to touch her in a way like that, I guess it dramatized. Uh, you, you seem to be pretty alert and, and, and pretty understanding of everything going on. Uh, you, you understand what we're doing here today? Yes, sir. Okay. Now you have some significant medical issues. Uh, am I right? Yes, sir. Could you explain in your own words what, what, how, how you get around? Are you able to move around at all? Can you walk? No, sir. I had to be pushed. What sort of things do you do all day while you're in prison? Mostly stay in the bed, sir. Yeah. You can't get out on your own at all. You have to be pushed around. You have to be uh, 
helped uh, out? Yes, sir. Dr. Prejean, uh, we, we, we've, uh, we've watched the videos, we have the videos, and we've observed the videos. Uh, if you could please give us uh, your assessment of Mr. Dabney. This is uh, obviously for a medical parole. Uh, so would you please give us your assessment of Mr. Dabney? Mr. Dabney is correct. He's uh, essentially a quadriplegic. He has some movement in his upper extremities, but it's extremely weak. He has no movement in his lower extremity. He is bed bound. Um, he has a cervical myelopathy. He had an anterior fusion done many years back. It did not go well and resulted in him being essentially a quadriplegic. He's very apathetic. He doesn't get out of bed. We on occasion force him out of bed, but it takes a whole year lift if you saw the video. Um, to get him out of bed and put him in a wheelchair. Very rarely have I seen him allow them to do that. Um, he also has a suprapubic catheter. He's got hypertension, he's got prediabetes. And because he's got that suprapubic catheter, he's uh, prone to getting recurrent uh, bladder infections. Some of them with um, multi-resistant organisms that requires IV therapy. When I got here, 16 months ago, he had a stage four decubitus from laying in the bed so much. Um, over the past year now, we've just about got it completely healed with taking uh, decubitus precautions, turning him, having him on the uh, alternating pressure mattress and daily wound care. Uh do you consider, in, in his medical condition, do you consider him to be a threat to society or to anyone on the outside at all? No. And uh, he will he will require assistance for the rest of his life. Is that fair to say? Yes, sir. Now I noticed in the video uh, uh, there was a lift. To, to, to pick him up from the bed, to put him in his chair. Is that basically required to move him around? Yes, sir. Now, except we do have a couple of real muscular guys that will sometimes, one of them in particular, I'm thinking of, he'll just come and pick him up and put him in the wheelchair. But um, even though I keep telling him not to do that, he's going to end up hurting himself one time, but he's like a big bodybuilder guy. He, He's the only one that can do it by himself, but the rest of it takes two or three people to actually get him out the bed and mobilize. And it's your opinion uh, that, uh, and, and your recommendation that we grant him a uh, uh, medical parole? Yes. And, and the secretary has also signed off on that as well. Uh, it's my understanding that it's been recommended that he go to the villa. Is that uh, the recommendation of the department? Um, Mr. Chairman, this is Warden Butters. Uh, villa is probably his best case scenario due to the nature of his conviction. Uh, there will be, uh, you know, limited resources on where he could stay in terms of total nursing home care. Uh, because of the the sex offense. So Villa would be our first option. And then from there, we would continue, you know, uh, searching for nursing homes that, that would be able to take someone like uh, Mr. Dabney and in the nature of his conviction. Okay. Uh, any questions? Okay. Uh, Mr. Dabney, is there anything you'd like to say to the board before uh, we vote? No, sir. Uh, I'll, I'll vote first. Uh, after reviewing the offender's crime and his criminal history, the length of time he served in prison, uh, uh, and his institutional conduct, which has been fair, uh, the offender represents a low risk to himself or society. 
Based upon his medical condition, he's a quadriplegic, confined to bed, chair, needing full assistance uh, for everything other than feeding himself. The medical assessment of the offender's condition, the diagnosis and the recommendation of Dr. Prejean, the medical director, uh, it is uh, my uh, vote that we grant him a medical parole to a uh, facility uh, acceptable to the Department of Corrections. Uh, and I don't know if it's necessary, but if at all possible, this person uh, would be would be improved to such a point that he no longer needed the medical parole, but he'd be returned to custody. So that would be my vote. Mr. Roche. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My vote is the same with the same conditions. Mr. Freeman? I concur. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Dabney, uh, you've been granted medical parole today to a facility uh, that is uh, recommended and approved by the Department of Corrections. Good luck to you, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you all very much for your assistance today. Do we have anyone else there? At, uh... yeah, we have. Okay. So we'll be back in just a little while. I don't have much to add to this case, except uh, maybe it's karma. Ugh. You know, I guess if there's any way for someone to get at least moved out of the regular facility for the crimes that he's committed, it's, uh, you could say it's this way, right? You know, just passing the dollar from one place to another, but, um, I mean, he's, <laughs> He hurt his condition. He's, he's a quadriplegic. And uh, that's definitely, it's, I don't know, I think you might call it karma. But the uh, Richard did find a, a report, but it doesn't talk about, it has nothing to do with why he's in prison. It actually has to do with the civil lawsuit that he made against the prison for different write-ups that he felt he shouldn't have, have received, write-ups where he was uh, wrongfully um, found guilty of certain crimes and it does seem that he won without prejudice, which is quite interesting. I didn't know if that was just interesting enough to go over those details with you or not. Uh, but I could put the link if I remember here in the description. So thank you, Richard, but we can go move to, to the next hearing. It's John. 27 years and some months, sir. Uh, tell me, uh, tell me why you're in prison. Tell me what you did that got you in prison. Tell me about this armed robbery and this uh, two counts of second degree murder and the second attempted at second degree kidnapping. Yes, sir. Um, not to justify anything that took place that night. I, I, I was terribly wrong, but I was an 18 year old uneducated drug addict that left my home and came here. And that night I put a gun in my hand and tried to take something from someone that didn't belong to me. What I did, Mr. Montreal that night and how I've been trying to find ways to explain to him that I'm sorry, I shouldn't have done what I did. And I've grown so much and not only do I owe him an apology, but I, I've listened to the statements that were made at my trial from his wife that watched what happened out of the window. I have to explain that I'm sorry to her. Also to Mr. Montreal's family, Milton Mayers, I, I, all of those people I owe an apology to, but I'm not that same 18 year old drug addict that I was back then. I've grown so much, I've learned so much, and I've lost so much. Let's, let's, talk, a little problem, bit about, let's talk a little bit about your drug addiction. Uh, yes, how sir. old were you when you first started using drugs? 14. And what did you start using at 14 years old? Marijuana. And progress from there to what? Opioids. Now, you went to prison for uh, receiving stolen things, right? Yes, sir. Is that drug-related as well? Was that, did that involve drugs? Were you doing drugs during the commission of those crimes? 
No, that was auto theft, joyriding. Well, understand. But were you a drug addict at that time? Yeah. Were drugs yeah. involved yes, in sir, some I was. way? Yes, how sir, I was. Were you, how often were you using drugs back then? Every day. And what were you using every day? I was marijuana, pills, LSD. How long did you go to prison before you actually paroled or were you on probation? I was placed on probation. Okay. Did you have to go to any kind of treatment at that time as a condition of your probation for your substance abuse issues? No, sir, I did. Did it come up that the drug addict at the time? I mean, did they no, do a pre-sentence investigation? Did the judge have any awareness of the fact that you were using drugs? No, sir. I I, I had a five-year probation under a plea bargain. I understand that. But, but at no time during that whole process did anyone say to the judge or your lawyer say to you, You've got a drug problem. You better clean it up. Otherwise, you're going to go back to prison. No, sir. Uh, in fact, I guess, as I'm speaking, I'm looking at my notes, never even reported to the probation office, did you? No, sir, I did. Okay. And you were on probation committing this crime? Yes, sir. Have you ever had any treatment on the outside for your substance abuse? As a as a juvenile. What what sort of treatment did you have as a juvenile? I was sent to a rehabilitation center called Twelve Oaks in Pensacola, Florida. And uh, how long did you stay there? Um, sixty days. Apparently that might have helped you for a short period of time, but, but you went back to using drugs again, right? Yes, sir, I did. Tell me why that is. What have you learned since then that you could explain to me why you were doing drugs? I, I was uneducated. I was, I felt like that was the answer. I didn't, I didn't understand life is more and i use drugs to escape but in in those process of escaping I, i've done so many different wrong things my addiction i'm i'm always going to have it i'm always going to be an addict but using is something that i won't do i have three beautiful grandkids i have to live for now tell me tell me why i should believe uh, give me some some reasons. Give me some some specific things that have occurred in your life that will make me believe that you're not going to go back to using drugs. I mean, I hear you know we hear people all the time. A lot changed. I've been in here. Uh, I've really thought about it. I know better now. Uh, but but tell me why. What specifically about you? Can you tell me? And I can walk away with the feeling that, look, this man is not going to go back to using drugs. So give me some specifics on what you're going to do if you get out to make sure you don't go back to using drugs. First, I'm going to pursue my career. I was uneducated then. Now I have a GED. I'm, I'm, I'm ASC certified in paint, paint and refinishing. I, I, I've, I've built a Toastmasters web patrol to where I want to use it in other substance abuse programs in, in society. I'm not going out there and use drugs because I realize that that's not a part of my life. That's not uh, where I'm, I'm, I'm hearing you say all of the words that you've learned in all of your classes. I want you to tell me specifically what Clark Ham is going to do the moment he gets out of jail to make sure he doesn't go back to using drugs. What is it? What, what will you tell me? You walking out of prison, and I'm sitting right there with you, and I'm saying, okay, Clark, now what? How are you going to stay out of drugs? What are you going to do? You're going to go look for a job, he said. Well, that's good, but, you know, that's not going to keep you off of drugs. 
what programs or what things have you learned that you need to do to keep you off of drugs? I, I've learned that I, I I need to understand that I have a problem, and well, I need to free you have need, a problem. That's the first step. And I need my family's support, and that I'm I'm defenseless without God with it. I understand this, and and that's who's going to help me not use my family, the 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 same people that I turned away from, thinking I knew everything, thinking that I was smart, and I left being an uneducated 18 year old, my family has always been there for me. And now I understand that the support they gave me was love and they can help me. Mr. Ham, have, you, you can have the greatest family in the world. And if you're a drug addict and you don't know how to keep yourself clean, you're gonna go back to using drugs. Sure, family is something that's important, what are your triggers? What what causes you to go do drugs? Now, don't tell me because you were uneducated. I, I don't buy that. That might have been a factor, but, but don't tell me that. Uh, you were an addict. It's a chemical process that makes you want to go do drugs. It's not something yes, you will away. You can't choose yes, not to do drugs. Yes, sir. Depression is depression was my trip. Okay. So how are we going to deal with your depression? I, I understand that that life has its ups and downs now. You know, I, I, I understand that I'm not going to succeed at everything I try, but I have to continue to keep going. Mr. Ham, let, let me let me slow you down. I was before I got on this board, I was a judge and yes, I did. Sir. I presided over the drug court for 14 years. And I've heard gobbledygook from everybody that used to come before me. But I want to know specifically what you're going to do. Are you going to, are you just going to go out, get a job, go to church on Sundays and hope everything works out? Or, or do you have a specific plan in place to make sure that every day you've got a plan in case things go bad? I mean, in no, that's okay. We can talk okay. about that. Yes, sir. But my going bad is if I see things going bad, I have to go to a meeting or something. I have to try to find a support group. I can't I can't say, okay, well, I'm gonna conquer it if it goes bad. No, I'm gonna need help. I understand that. I, I I'm gonna need a support system. I'm gonna need meetings. I'm gonna need all these things to succeed. I can't do it by myself. It's it's it just doesn't happen. So tell but me at what that time, tools are. Tell me what you're gonna do. I, if I if I find myself wanting to use, I'm gonna go to meetings. I'm well, gonna you see, see, Mr. Ham, therein lies the problem. When you feel like you might do drugs, you're too late. Yes, sir. The meetings are essential from the get-go. That's what I want to hear from you. Mr. Maravella, when I get out of this prison, I'm going to AA meetings every day. I'm going to go there before anything happens. I'm not going to wait till I get the urge to do drugs. That's too late. Yes, sir. And that's, that's what I see on your resume. I don't see that you've taken a lot of substance abuse courses. You've taken a lot of courses and you've taken a lot of things like collision courses, uh, you've attended Ashland, uh, you've, you've got collision repair, you've got a good history of that. But all I've seen you do, you've got a little bit of, of living in balance, you've got some pre-release, but I don't see that you've done any long-term drug treatment. I don't see that you've got a real plan and that's my concern. My concern is, how are you going to make sure you're proactive in staying clean? And I haven't heard that. I heard you say the right things. You know, I'm going to go to meetings. When I feel like I'm, I got the urge, I'm going to go to meetings. I bet you you never even thought about the urge. When you were on the streets, you were just doing drugs. That's how it happens. You know, it just, you know you're not going to get a text that says, hey, I think you might want to do drugs. You better go to a meeting. That's not going to happen. 
you're going to boom, be there, and you're going to find yourself back. So tell me what programs you've taken having to do with substance abuse that can help you stay sober. You talked a little bit about the meetings, but but you talked about going to meetings when you get or when you have temptations. That's too late. Have you had any long-term substance abuse treatment? Have you gone to something like Steve Boyle? Have you gone through their program, the program we have there at the facilities? No, sir, I haven't. Tell me a little bit about your uh, your disciplinary issues. Uh, you've lost uh, a lot of good time. 465 days of good time you've lost. Tell me about that. That was at the time that I was receiving contraband write-ups for dirty urines, well, dirty drug screens. When was that? Um, before 2014, in the beginning of my incarceration. What was your last write-up for? Um, uh, 21. Tell me what, tell me about that. What was that about? It was, it wasn't between a, um officer or, or a free person. It was between a, me and another offender, sexual contact between me and another offender. What, what would be your, you, you, you talked about your education and you yes. got Got your GED, which which uh, is very commendable, uh, and you seem to really have worked hard uh, in the collision repair field. Uh, so, what would be your your transition plan? What kind of work would you hope to do when you get out? I wanna I wanna it, go into collision repair, but I also wanna open my own business. I wanna open my own shop. Did you ever have a job before you came to prison? I've had really? jobs at at little restaurants, but I've never had a steady job. Where would you be living? Who would you be living with? I'll be living with my brother right at, at my release. Uh, aside from the certificates that you've received uh, in in uh, vocational training, car repair, things like that, what do you consider to be the best program you've ever taken? While you, what what program has meant the most to you since you've been in prison? I would say victim awareness. Tell me about that. Victim awareness showed me that no matter what we do, it always has a long line of people involved in it. Even with the write-up that I received, after taking victim awareness, I realized that that write-up not only hurt me, but it hurt the students that I was teaching in Votech. It hurt the people that believed in me in Votech. It, 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 just, it, it just didn't hurt me. And in victim awareness, I realized that when I did what I did to Mr. Montreal, I didn't just do it to him. I did it to his family, his mom, his wife, everybody that supported him, as well as Mr. Mayor, his wife, and everything that they've had involved. I, I, I learned a lot of responsibility from that victim awareness class. And it taught me that my selfishness is what brought me to prison. And I needed to start to think of others. How long have you been a pride member? I've just received it back after that write-up. And when was the write-up that you, you talked about? Second, when was that? How long ago was that? A year and three months ago, I think. And uh, how long have you been in Toastmasters? 
since 14, 2014. Tell me about the reentry club. That's a club that we utilize to help with education here and, and um, like you said, substance abuse and mental health department. It's to really help the inmate population do something positive. Now, how, how old, uh, you have one son? No, sir, I had a daughter. You had a daughter? Yes, sir. What, what can you tell us about uh, Mr. Ham? Huh. Yes, sir, good morning, board. Uh, I got a lot to say about Mr. Ham as well. You, you mentioned his pride membership. He lost it during that hiccup he had with that write-up, but he had it for years prior to that. And I will say, in our body, in our boat tech, he's definitely one of our trusted individuals down there that really works hard. He's our go-to. He's very talented in that area. I mean, there, there's no doubt. He um, he just uh, very always has a very respectful attitude and does everything we need to do down there. As far as his write-up history, um, his last contraband write-up was in '13, and I've he's not known to be a drug user around, you know, we, we kind of know what's going on around here a little bit. He's never been known to be a drug user or anything since that time frame. Um, and what's another interesting thing, just to tell you, I always interview him beforehand before we have our meetings here. And he told me in the interview, he was anxious to get out there and do his AA meetings and stuff. And then he gets in here and doesn't mention it. So I don't know whether he's nervous or not, but, um, but besides that, he, he does a great job here. I just wanted that to be known. Thank you, Warden. I appreciate your comments. Um, you have a question, Mr. Uh, Roche? Good morning, Mr. Ham. How are you? Good morning, sir. I'm okay. After you received the 21C in May of 2021, your quarters changed and you were assigned to maximum quarters lockdown. How long did you stay in lockdown? About four days, sir. So you were released in lockdown four days after you were assigned to that particular uh, facility? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You didn't serve the 30 days that I see on your disciplinary report? No, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, All right, now we'll hear from uh, uh, your supporters. Uh, we'll hear from your mother, Ms. Janice Searcy. Ms. Janice, if you would, please. Hello? Yes, ma'am. Tell us your name and tell us what you'd like us to know about your son. Janice Searcy. Um, I'd just like to say Clark is not the same 18 year old that was arrested. I've seen him grow through the years and I'm proud of who he is now. I know he has a tainted past, but I'm gonna do everything in my power to support him through whatever he needs support with. I pray that you find it in your heart to release him. Thank you. Thank you very much, ma'am. And now we'll hear from uh, Mr. Uh, Kelvin Cersei. Sir, can you hear us? Yes, sir, now he. Okay, uh, why don't you tell us what you'd like us to know about your son? Well, for my time of 12 years that I've had, I married his mother, and the contact that I've had and the conversations I've had with him has all been about how he wants to get his life, how he's going to get his life straight, and when he's released, and all the things that has happened is behind him, and he wants to put that past behind him, and continue to, to make a new life for himself. 
outside of these walls. And uh, I am a minister of the gospel and will do everything I can to steer him in the right direction. Mm -hmm. I've numerous of times prayed with him on different occasions as our conversation was. So that's what I see and would also uh, remind y'all to his, uh, find it in your heart, in your heart to do, to release him on that. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much, sir. Appreciate your comments. Um, and finally, in opposition, we have Ms. Margaret Hay. Ms. Hay? Yes, good morning again, um, members of the board. Um, without rehashing um, everything that we've been over as it relates to Mr. Ham, um, it is the state's position that Mr. Ham is um, a, po a poor parole risk. He certainly has had what I would consider to be limited programming. Um, and um, there is um, strong victim opposition in this matter. I think that before um, someone is released on parole, they should and need to work to get their life straight while incarcerated and take advantage of the many programs that are available to them to prepare themselves for a straight life um, once released, if released. And I just do not feel like that has taken place um, sufficiently in this, in Mr. Ham's case and the strong um, victim opposition, the state would request that um, parole be denied at this time. Thank you. Say so we appreciate your comments. Thank you. Mr. Ham, is there anything you'd like to say before the board votes? I, I fully understand everything that you have talked to me about. And I understand <laughs> that in finding ways to stay sober is taking the first initiative not letting situation arise and then take advantage. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much, Mr. Ham. Mm -hmm. right. Mr. Ham, uh, I have listened very intently to uh, your discussion today, uh, our interview with you. Uh, you know, it concerns me that you've lost so much good time it concerns me that you had a write-up not long ago. Uh, it concerns me a little bit about uh, your substance abuse addiction, what you might do with that. Uh, uh, I agree with the warden. Uh, I think you've got a plan, but perhaps uh, today you were nervous and maybe didn't articulate exactly what you had in mind, although some of the things you said didn't resonate very well with me, because I know a lot of people think, well, you know, uh, I have AA to fall back on when things get tough, but that's just not the case. AA has to come first, uh, your treatment has to come first, and then the plan comes second. Uh, you do have a law enforcement opposition, obviously, uh, you've got victim opposition, uh, you've done some good things. You've been a pride member. Uh, you're back being a pride member. Uh, you've done Toastmasters. Uh, you're a low risk, but moderate needs, but high on substance abuse. Uh, based upon the things that you've accomplished while you've been in prison, uh, based upon the programs that you've taken, based upon your transition plan, based upon the good, very good content that uh, one victim has given you. Uh, I'm willing to take a chance on you, but my chance is going to be conditioned upon your entering a long-term substance abuse treatment while you're in prison. Upon completion of that program, my vote would be to grant you a condition upon your completing programs such as the steam oil program. Uh, and upon completion of that, following any and all of their recommendations, which would include three AA meetings per week and a curfew from 9 p.m. to 6 a.m. I am one, but one of three votes. But that's my vote. 
so we'll see how it pans out. Okay. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Mr. Ham, I have severe reservations about you. This man right up uh, in May of 2021. It's very serious right up. I did discuss that right up because of in indifference to your your family. The very serious right up. We were sent to lockdown. But I like everything else. Painting yes, and automotive painting. Uh, you now realize that you have to be proactive substance abuse. And if you complete the nine month Steve Hall program, you will be two years without a disciplinary writer. So I'm going to agree with Ms. Marabella, a conditional grant. And that's conditioned upon you completing a nine month Steve Hall program. And that completion, please follow all conditions that were outlined by Ms. Marabella. Good luck. Thanks, Mr. Mr. Friedman? Uh, uh, Mr. Ham, uh, I also agree with my colleagues. Uh, go to that program, sit on the front row, get the most you can out of it. And uh, once you complete it, then you'll be released. So uh, good luck. Mr. Ham, you have three votes to grant your parole conditioned upon your completing the Steve Hall program. Uh, I hope you understand that's not a punishment. It's something hopefully that we believe will help you uh, we want you to get out, but we want you to stay out. So, uh, Warden, if you can assist him in getting into that program, uh, we would certainly appreciate it. Yes, sir. Good luck to you, Mr. Ham. So, they really didn't go into the details of the crime at all, and I don't have any information to share on it. When you, you know, Richard couldn't find anything. It's interesting. Clark Ham with two, I thought maybe, a, you know, it's it wouldn't be a common name. I can't even find if he's out um, or still in DOC. I would assume he's out. This hearing took place in uh, October 2022, the time of this recording, March 26, 2024. Um, but maybe no news is good news in this case. Um, gosh, he had like a 80 year sentence or something. He served how many? 26 years so far on armed robbery, attempted homicide and kidnapping. Um, I can only imagine that it was probably a quite a, an awful crime to have all those different charges in there. Attempted homicide could mean that he shot him and he didn't die. It could be that he shot him and missed. It's, again, without the information. Um, but I do think that he seems to be a great image of someone who's rehabilitated, right? I maybe it's i'm being influenced by his speaking abilities i think he's a good speaker he brings up toastmasters ironically if that's the right word the da could probably uh use a few of his classes um i think he outspoke the da i've never seen a da that that says um as many times as she did it, it was it's just surprising because if you have a job where you need to be speaking publicly how can it be that you would have that type of issue where where um is being said every five or six words it felt like that's confusing to me we we've only this is the first and last time that we've seen her in the 2000 hearings that we've done and it's almost like i think she just showed up to, to for some reason, because she felt she had to. But when you don't bring up the details of the crime as a sort of emphasis, uh, the the other thing that was interesting, if you're curious about is 21C write-up. So 21 is always the sex offenses that you can have in prison, but C is not, is not uh, C is on the lesser of it, right? So A is the one that you don't want. That's non-consensual. Um, C, it just means that you're having misconduct, offender on offender. 
or even attempted uh, conduct between, you know, basically your parts and, and another offender, including, and they go through, you know, it's however slight, it can be this, it can be that. Um, so here it is. So it, uh, it's of the lesser 21s, I, I, I believe. Um, it's, uh, it must have been embarrassing for him if his family had no idea that he's doing that and it gets called out. Can you imagine having uh, that exposed to your family at your parole hearing if they have no idea that that's what's going on? And Mr. O'Shea didn't want to get into the details, but never really seen them ever get into those details. On a 21C, they just bring it up. I don't think I've ever, that I can recall, right? So it's not like, uh, I don't know. You know. Maybe there was something a little bit more <laughs> than, uh, than is typical which is why Mr. O'Shea said that, but I don't know. But anyways, I, I really don't have any much else to add to this because I don't have documentation to go over. But when you don't hear from the victim and a life wasn't taken and he served already all this time, and it seemed to me that he's done well while in prison. I mean, if, if anyone's going to get out, wouldn't it be him? That's my opinion. I'd love to hear yours. And with that, I'll let you go. Classified as a sixth felony offender, offenses, simple burglary, theft, forcible rape. Sentencing dates are April 17, 1989, revoked on June 30th, 1995, and April 15, 1998. January 23rd, 1996, and February 9th, 1999. Sentenced to a total of 36 years, 8 months, 18 days. Parole date is August 1st, 2021. Good time, March 23rd, 2033. Full term, December 29, 2034. Is this information correct? Uh, Mr. McDonough, how long have you been incarcerated? Um, about 24 years. You've been 24 years. Uh, have you took all four phases of sex offender programs? Yes, sir. I got yes, sir. What is your job? What are you mm -hmm. doing right now in your job top? Don Marley. You're Don Marley. Where you live at? Where are you originally from? You live? Well, where I'm originally stay at. Monroe. Mm -hmm. I stay at Monroe, but my sister stay in uh, Winsboro, Louisiana. In Winsboro, Louisiana? Yes, yes, sir. Uh, you know, I, I look back here on 1978. You had attempted simple rape. 79, a simple battery, simple burglary, simple burglary. And it goes in intensive. But, you know, I see some sex offense charges there along the way. Contributing delinquency of a minor uh, juvenile. Uh, that was in Winsboro Parish. Uh Till all this came up, uh, have, where have you been housed at mostly? Did you was you have you been there a pretty good while? Well, in Winsboro. Yeah, you was at the Louisiana State Pen back in five nine or twenty. Is that right? During the uh, that was COVID transfer. I'm just trying to see if you been. You was at Raymond Boer eighty nine. To my end Golden. Yeah. I, uh, in 99, you was in Angola. I see that. It's transferred to Angola. Yeah, I, was, I think I was sick. I think I had the coronavirus. Okay. Yes, yeah, oh, so you are, you're a classified as a fifth class offender. You got out, and, uh, and then you got revoked back in 2-9-1999. Is that correct? Yes, sir. That, uh, yes, sir. You were okay. you were on some you had a in eight ninety five you were arrested and convicted of a new felony theft and then you was revoked and then back with 
in October 27, 97, he was arrested and convicted on a forcible rape in 98 during the time he was out. Uh, where would you live if you were, if you were to get out? Where would I go? Uh, uh, yeah, where would you live? Would be your residence. Trying uh, to find out. You'd be living with someone. Trying to make my, my trying to make my older sister. That's my older sister. Yo, where does she live? She stay in Winsboro. That's the only resident I have. All the rest of yeah, my state. So I just want you to know there's a there's a lot of opposition on your case on this case. I just want you to know that. Yes, sir. Um, and uh, where did you take all the all four phases in your sex offender program? In Winfield, I got a yeah. I see a Winfield, and uh, I got a community roadblock. I got a responsibility. I'm not talking about the roadblock. I'm talking about all four phases sex offender oh, program. Yeah. I I can't find that, it. Have y'all found uh, it, Mr. Roche, Mr. Mr. Wise, there is no indication that he's completed the sex offender treatment in our information. I can't find it. I've looked everywhere, everywhere where he finished the all four phases of the program. I had I had a certificate. I got all the certificates. I seen some certificates you have, but I'm talking about on the sex offender program. I see I've seen some of your certificates and I've seen where it said some of the programs you've taken. Yeah, well that was that was one of them right there. Yeah, I understand, but that's not the program that I want. Wanted. But uh, I don't have any other questions. Thank you. So um Mr. McDaniel, you, you say you completed sex offender treatment. Where were you when you took a, did that? I was at Winfield. I was at so, Winfield Correct. I do see on the institutional progress report where it says that he did thinking for change and anger management at LSP. Yeah, yeah, yes, ma'am. And that I he did. did sex offender and social skills at Win. And yes, the roadblock yes, that he mentioned. Yes, yes, so it doesn't okay. indicate what program that was. It does. It was a sex offender program. I'm assuming that's the one that the uh, DOC developed. I don't know. Um, <laughs> is there anybody there uh, at Madison that would like? To, is there anybody in the room with you? Uh, no, ma'am. Okay, you're by yourself. Is there yes, anything you want to say to us before we vote? Um, yes, ma'am. I'd like to uh, know what I be going on. I, I pray that I go. Um, uh, otherwise, I, I hope y'all grant me a parole. Well, Mr. McDaniel, let me ask you this How old was your victim, ma'am? How old was the victim? Um, I don't know how old she was. I don't know how old she was. It was eight, Mr. Vanessa. Oh, back then? Yeah. Yeah. Eight, is that correct? Uh, yes, yes, ma'am. And how old were you? At the time, I was, uh, I think I was like 30, 31. I was, I, I, uh, uh, 38. Yeah, 38. I was, uh, at the time, I, at the time, I, uh, when that occurred, happened, I was, I was drinking, I was drinking and, uh, and got in the room, possessing in the house of my, I was drinking during that time and I was, uh, got in the room bed with my with my stepdaughter. That was one of my that was the only problem. That was the only thing that was uh that's the only 
Good uh, thing uh, <coughs> with matter I was doing drinking during the time. Mm -hmm. And uh, so in all those programs that I see, I don't see any uh, substance abuse programs. Uh, uh, I was about to take the uh, substance abuse program during that time, but they had shipped me him. Okay. All right. I think, uh, Mr. McDaniel, the panel's prepared to vote. We'll start with Mr. Wise. At this time, I'm going to be voting to deny. One of the reasons I'm voting to deny, I want to see him get some more program substance abuse, also uh, some more sex offender programs. And uh, there's very strong law enforcement opposition to criminal history and it's poor supervision while out on uh, supervision. At this time, my vote is to deny. Mr. Roche? Uh, Madam Chairman, Mr. McDaniel. My vote is the same for the same reasons. And I do agree, Mr. McDaniel. My vote today is to deny based on the, uh, the opposition that's been expressed and uh, the need for treatment. So today, sir, your parole has been denied. Good luck to you, sir. Uh, yes, ma'am. Could I ask you another question? Real quick. Uh, well, um, but they'll keep me here or they'll send me somewhere else. I'm not sure. We will note that we that we think you need some some additional program. It's up to DOC if they move you or not. We'll see. All right. Maybe you're wondering if you heard that correctly, but uh, if you've seen enough of these parole hearings, you're going to stop to to second guess yourself. Yes, yes. He said that he had drunk too much and got into the wrong bed. Mm -hmm. With the eight year old. Oops. Oopsies, wrong bed. Oh, I don't. I had no idea what was going on. I just I drank too much, and I I thought, you know, we've had multiple hearings where the excuse was I thought that it was her mother. I crawled in the wrong bed. I I, I didn't know. I thought it was her mother. You know, the, the this is this. It's it is crazy that he has so many arrests, including for these type of crimes of a sexual nature and that they just keep letting him out. They keep letting him out. And, you know, he was denied parole. He is still locked up. Uh, he has a long sentence and he's not a young man. Um, you know, we don't have any other information on, on his crime, but I do think that is good. He's going to be close to 80 if he does serve his full sentence by the time he gets out. Now, if he does get another parole hearing, we will share it. This hearing took place November of 2021, which was two years ago, almost the date of me doing this recording. But uh, yeah, I he seems to have you know lied about completing his sex offender programs. Um, of course, we had our our wonderful you know our wonderful brilliant Jim Wise there, who is you know Miss Renatz is trying to conduct an interview, and you think that you know you have Jim Wise who's answering the questions on his behalf. Ms. Renasa probably has that info in front of her. She doesn't need you, Jim, to tell her what, you know, what is, what the age of, of his victim was or how old he was. Like, come on, man. I just, I, I my, my disgust for Jim Wise, it seems to just grow and grow. I'm so happy he's not involved with the board. But to think he was the longest serving board member, I think for 16 years or something, which is just absurd. I mean, why? Why would so many governors of, uh, just keep this guy on is, is uh, I think, just just the classic example of how broken our systems can be, that you can have someone on. Who, who who doesn't seem to have any regard for 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 you know victims any empathy for them um it kind of just barks and yells at everyone it's uh anyways i don't know and, and to somehow just to stay on board through through multiple governors is is quite telling to me but i'm happy that he's stayed locked up and Hope he stays there because you can't, you know, you can't risk, you can't risk him by mistake getting into the wrong bed again. You know what I mean? Oh, yeah, that's it.